The Pew Research Organization conducted a study just a few years ago inquiring about why Americans do not attend church. The number of people who do not attend church is uh, declining. We understand that, or, or uh, growing. The number who aren't attending is growing. But, uh, but maybe not for the reason you thought. What they found in this study is that less than one-third, actually 28%, say they don't go to church because they don't believe. So among non-churchgoers who identify as Christians, 46% say they practice their faith in other ways, and 33% say they just haven't found a church that they like. So is this correct? Can you just check out of church like choosing not to join the local gym because you can work out at home? Well... Peter demonstrates to us why it's simply not the same. Would you turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2 as we continue in our study of the, this letter that Peter wrote to the believers in Asia Minor? As you're turning there, may I remind you about caring for Katie. We've already talked about it, but next Sunday we will gather as a church all over the area. I think this is the perfect message for us to look at this passage before we scatter in that, in that way. May I tell you something? I've been at Kingsland 10 years almost, and um, the first year I came to Kingsland and I heard about caring for Katie, I, as a pastor, it's just like it's not in our DNA. It was really strange. Like, wait, wait what? We're, we're not gathering on that Sunday? And I, I really wasn't sure about it. And then I saw it, and I recognized that it makes a statement to all of us. It, it's a part of our DNA because it greatly impacts the other 51 Sundays when we recognize that this is not the end game, that we are to turn our attention outward into the world to share the love of Jesus Christ. And so may I encourage you uh, next Sunday, don't be among the few who say, well, this is a great day to like just uh, get some donuts, go back home, stay in our pajamas and pretend like it's COVID. Don't do this. It's caring for Katie, caring for Katie. We left off last week and uh, we remembered that Jesus Christ is the living cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. We can have full confidence that Jesus is both God and Messiah. But Peter's not only telling us who Jesus is, he's telling us because of who Jesus is, we're a part of something really special in his church. And so I want to read for you 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 12. You look on as I read. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by people, but chosen and honored by God, you yourselves as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture... See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and honored cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. So honor will come to you who believe, but for the unbelieving, the stone that the builders rejected, this one has become the cornerstone, and a stone to stumble over, and a rock to trip over. They stumble because they disobey the word. They were destined for this, but you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So Peter is saying biblical community isn't some idea that we should say, well, it's just something that we have to do. It should be dreaded. No, Peter gives us some vivid pictures here of who the church is supposed to be and what a privilege it is that we gather in this way. May I just say how deeply grateful I am for the people of Kingsland. I'm preaching to a people today who are already deeply engaged, as you can see today, as you walk the hallways and see what God's doing at Kingsland. So I don't have to preach a message here and guilt you into coming to church. Oh, please come back. Please come, please, please, please stop what you're doing and come to church. Thank you for your commitment to the body of Christ. And yet it's here in the scriptures as a good reminder of why this is so important. So on the, the difficult days or the times that you may be tempted to, to go off on your own, you recognize the importance of commitment to the local church. Uh, there are some incredible truths in this passage that demonstrate why. 
we must remain committed and we should remain committed to the local body of believers. May I share those with you? Here's the first truth I want you to see that Peter shares. The church is a supernatural people. In verse 4, where we really camped out last week, it says, as you come to him, speaking of Jesus, a living stone. Then in verse 6, Jesus is the cornerstone. So he's more than a figurehead, but he is the standard on which we build the rest of the building of the church. The church is deeply rooted in Christ. So deeply, in fact, that one of the ways we express the idea of the church is something we say so often, maybe we've lost the power of its meaning. We are referred to, folks, as the body of Christ. It's incredibly important. It's spiritual what we're a part of here. Do you see? In, in fact, if you look back at verse 5, you'll notice that this isn't just any building that Peter is using as an illustration. It says, you yourselves as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. A spiritual house. Peter is referencing in this illustration the temple, the temple in Jerusalem. That's what he's talking about. The word temple simply means a dwelling place of God among his people. So when we consider that most, ba most basic definition, the dwelling place of God among his people, when I look at scripture, I see at least eight expressions of the temple in the scripture. I'm just going to list those for you because I want you to understand something very significant that Peter is wanting to bring out here, I believe. Uh, number one, the first temple in that sense is the tabernacle of Moses. In the wilderness where God dwelt with his people uh, during that wandering period. Number two, Solomon's temple, when finally there was a permanent house of worship for Jehovah. Number three, Solomon's temple was destroyed, Israel is exiled, and then came the temple of Zerubbabel in Ezra chapter three. Now, some would argue that Herod's temple would be temple number four, but it's the same temple. The temple was certainly improved by Herod, but it's the same. So that's number three, the temple of Zerubbabel. Number four, the temple of Christ's body when Jesus walked on earth. I think about John 2, 20 through 22. Jesus made this remarkable statement. Therefore the Jews said, this temple took 46 years to build and you will raise it up in three days, verse 21. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. And when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the statement Jesus had made. Jesus, of course, was God in the flesh. He was God with us, the temple. Number five, when Jesus ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost and believers were given the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter two to dwell in God's people. So we became the temple. This incredible event continues today. Consider a couple of passages. The first part of 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And the first part of 2 Corinthians 6, 16 says, and what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. So this is really a twofold miracle of the temple described here. First, the believer in Jesus is now the dwelling place of the Spirit of God. And second, the collective of believers, all of us together, are the dwelling place of God together. So that's in view here in verse 5 of 1 Peter 2. We are living stones. We are the temple. Folks, we are living in the midst of temple number 5. Briefly, just in case you're curious, let me list the, the other three. Uh, number six, the tribulational temple. In Matthew 24, 15, Revelation 11, 1, we have evidence of a future temple in Jerusalem in which Antichrist uh, will, will desecrate the temple. Number seven, in the millennium, there'll be a physical temple where Jesus Christ reigns among his people, according to Ezekiel 40 and Acts 15, 16. And finally, number eight, we have the heavenly temple. Uh, represented in Revelation chapters 11, 14, 15, 16, and 17. There's a form of the temple in heaven, and ultimately the fact that God himself is dwelling with us in the new heavens and the new earth. So eight temples. 
But going back to number five, I want you to let something seek in, sink in. In all of human history, the king of kings, the author of life, the creator of the universe has eight different expressions of himself among his people. You, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and we, the body of those who follow Jesus Christ, are living today as one of those expressions, living stones. My friend, the church is a big deal. And when you let that sink in, the idea that I don't need the church to be a Christian sounds empty and disconnected with God's plan. There is no frame of reference in God's word for a guy who says, hey, nature is my church. I just walk among the trees and I can be with God. No way. The church is a supernatural people. Here's the second truth that Peter brings out. The church is a supportive people. Back in verse 5, you get a better understanding of the importance of gathering. You yourselves as living stones. It doesn't say you yourself as living stone. It says living stones, plural. There is a deep connection here among us. Stone buildings are built with stone, laid on top of stone, laid on top of stone. A lone stone wasn't much use. This is never more true than when crisis happens, the beauty of the body of Christ. When people come running to surround others in the community of believers, bearing one another's burdens, I'm so grateful for the church. It's also true in everyday life. When we, we enjoy one another's gifting, God has uniquely gifted you uh, when you came to faith in Christ. And the scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 that that gifting needs to be used. And if it's not, the whole body is robbed. So we're meant to fit together to encourage one another. You need the church and the church needs you. And of course, the third benefit of gathering is we look together to truth. Acts chapter 2, 42 says, that speaking of the early church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So they came to recalibrate, to know true north by looking at God's word. You might say, well, pastor, I'm there, I got you there because I can read the Bible by myself. Yes, you can. But there's something powerful about coming together. You ought to read the Bible by yourself. You ought to pray together. But when we come together, we encourage one another, sharpen one another, and we focus sometimes on the passages of Scripture that you don't love yourself. When we're left alone, sometimes we just go to those pet areas that we like the most. We need people around us bearing the truth of God's word so that we can help one another see our blind spots. It's so important. Last week, I, I talked about the, the centrality of Jesus Christ, and I had the marker board up here, remember, and I was doing a little math, and some of you remember I was going through the odds of Jesus Christ uh, being represented by anyone, or the Messiah being represented by anyone other than Christ, and I went through some of those odds, and I, I said in the message, hey, if you're not a math person, just hang with me. Well, I, I made uh, an, a tactical error at the 11 o'clock service. Lana, my wife, was sitting right down here, and I was starting, and I saw her, and so I, I used the same phrase, but I said, okay, those who don't love math, Lana, hang with me for just a minute. And you know, I just, she gave me that look. You seen that look? Like, oh, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna pay for this. And then I turned around, you might remember, and I said, the odds, for example, of Jesus being born in Bethlehem, one in 300,000. Well, I was going quickly, and I wrote one in 30,000 up here. And I just kept going. And Lana told me at lunch, after I was uh, apologizing, <laughs> she said, I have to tell you, I looked up, and I saw your error on the board, and she said, every fiber in me wanted to get up on that stage, <laughs> grab your marker, and just add a zero and go sit down. And she said, I want you to know something. I would have had the support of every woman in that room. I said, noted. It sure is good to have somebody to show you your blind spots, right? There is nothing more dangerous than a person who doesn't know what he doesn't know. That's why we need one another. We're supposed to be a, a supportive people. We're supposed to come together in this way. Attendance is, is necessary for this. Do you understand that? You, you have to have attendance to have connection. Um, connection calls for attendance. I, one of my least favorite phrases as a pastor through the years has been this one. Pastor, we can't be there today. We're going to be at such and such, but we'll be with you in spirit. What does that mean? 
Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, Paul used that same phrase. So it's biblical, but the idea Paul was saying was, I'm going to write the word that's inspired of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to share this letter with you. So I wish I could be there, but I'll be with you in spirit in the sense that I'm sharing uh, I'm sharing the truth of God's word with you. I'm not sure what we mean when we say it today. I'm going to be at the ball field, but I'll be with you in spirit. You know what I really wish is your pastor? I wish somebody would say, Pastor, uh, I'm going to be at the, the baseball field in spirit today, but I'll be there in person. I, I'm going to be at church today, but I'll be at the golf course in spirit today. I, I'm going to stay in my pajamas and sleep in in spirit today, but I'll be there in person. That's so much better. I'll just be honest with you. Attendance is a part of connection. That's why in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, we're exhorted not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. We stay in this habit of connecting in that way. Almost every time the word church is used in the Bible, it refers to a local congregation that is gathering. The New Testament always assumes connection to a local church and attendance with other believers. It doesn't mean that you can't travel. We don't browbeat each other when we cannot be here, but we see this as an elevated priority. And may I say something to the moms and dads in the room? Your kids are watching you, and they're watching what you choose over being together with other believers. When you choose the club sports or you choose to stay home because you're tired or you choose these things, you're saying a message to your kids. Listen, it, it matters. Uh, it requires attendance, but it also requires commitment. You cannot microwave real relationship. When people from all walks of life come together, listen, there are always going to be differences. And at a church like Kingsland, this is especially true. We have all generations that worship together. It requires some some stretching. We have people with various disabilities uh, and, and challenges who come together. And we want to welcome everybody. And that, that requires us uh, stretching. We have people from all over the world come together from different cultures. All these things require us to accommodate one another. That doesn't happen without commitment. Do you see? That's what God's calling us to here. Being semi-connected to the church is sort of like living together without getting married. You're robbed of true intimacy because you're saying, hey, I love you for what I can get from you, but not enough to make any promises or sacrifice. That's not the way it works. It's not the what God has in mind. Uh, it's robbing a generation of what the church is supposed to be. Some of you need to join Kingsland. You say, well, I don't know about membership. I mean, I'll come and I'll sit here. We have next step classes on a regular basis where you can learn all about the church. The next one at Central is March the 17th. The next one at North Katy is at April the 7th. You can sign up before you leave today. I'm asking you to go all in as a member of your church. And listen, if you can't do that at Kingsland for whatever reason, find a place where you can invest your life and go full throttle with the body of Christ. Sometimes I hear people say, hey, pastor, I like the church, but I don't like the organized church. I always want to say, well, then what do you like, the disorganized church? Is that what you're going for? Because the reality is we have to have some level of organization if we're going to cooperate together, be connected to one another, and remain committed to one another. Some people say the Bible doesn't even talk about membership. That's true. It doesn't use that word, but it's an appropriate word because when the Scripture has the idea of membership, it's not talking about membership in an organization the idea is being a member of a family. Do you see? That's the type of commitment we have. The church is so critical, mission critical. Why? Because the church is a supernatural people. The church is a supportive people. And finally, I want you to see, the church is a sent people. God isn't just gathering us so that we can gather. He's gathering us to send us. It's like the huddle in a football game. Games are not won in the huddle, but you have to huddle up to get the place, and then we go. We can never just celebrate the huddle. We come together and celebrate what God is doing when we break the huddle and we go from this place. That's a reminder we have every year with Caring for Katie. And every single week, God is calling us to do this. He has sent us. He has sent us to the area around Katie. He sent us a few years ago to North Katie. And he's sending all of us to our neighbors. God is doing this incredible work in our church right now. I pinch myself sometimes that I get to be a part of this. I've heard amazing stories about what God has done since the very early days of Kingsland. 
And you know what? We're living in one of those days, the good old days, and we're going to look back someday and say, look at what the Lord has done. We're seeing things happen right now that are things only God can do. These are rooted in an understanding of being sent. Do you understand? Look back at verse 9. I want you to notice something that Peter wrote. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, I want you to notice something here. Peter changes the word picture from the building of the temple to the people who serve that temple. Who? The priests. He calls us priests. What's the role of a priest? A priest is to be the mediator between God and others. We have the opportunity to present God to others. Now, if you go back and look at your Old Testament, you see something really unique about the priests. They came from one particular tribe. Church, who is that? Tribe of Levi. That's right, the Levites. The descendants of Aaron were the priests, and the rest of the Levites supported the priests. But watch this. When the nation was formed, what land did the tribe of the Levites receive? None. They didn't get a land. Why? Instead, priestly cities were established throughout the nation for them to dwell so that they would be the ones to intercede and bring light to the darkness. Listen, God didn't want the priestly line to settle, to grow complacent, and miss the mission of being a scattered people. The church is called to be a sent people. Our roles as the church is to allow God to scatter and send us. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to pack your bags and go somewhere else in the world. What it does mean is you have to be prepared to go beyond wherever God providentially places you, even right here. Kingsland, we can never settle. We've been given too much to do so. Just an aside, let me, let me talk logistics with you for just a moment. This is such an important season. We've been asking God, many of you with me, that the Lord would allow us to see 1,000,007 homes transformed by the power of the gospel in the next 10 years. Those are things we can't do on our own. It's going to require God's mighty hand. And we're seeing that happen all over the world. I'm grateful. But as we seek to take part in that vision, we have a, re we have a strategic challenge right here. We've invested heavily in the infrastructure of the North Katy campus over the last few years. Many of you have been uh, give, given sacrificially in order to see that happen. There will be over 500 gathering for worship at North Katy this morning. It's incredible what God has done. Do you see? But I do believe we're in a season where all of Kingsland needs to turn our attention to the infrastructure here at Central to make sure that we are accommodating all of our neighbors. We're reaching a point of capacity here at the church in worship, both in the courts and the worship center, where that's even right now a present problem, not to mention the thousands that God has called us to reach in the future. And so some of you are a part of the town hall meetings at North and at Central this last fall when we brought forth the idea of perhaps uh, exploring building a new worship center here at the Central Campus. Well, since that time, I've met with hundreds of you. We assembled a council to pray through and consider the details of that. And I'm more convinced than ever that we need to take some steps in that direction. But here's what that means in the next phase of, of getting ready. On March the 3rd, we'll host another town hall meeting right here uh, in, this, in the uh, worship center to talk through the details of what's next and what we've found. But it also means March the 17th, when we, like we do every year, vote as a church on the church budget, we're going to vote on whether we take some next steps toward building a, a new worship center. Now, here's what that means. That means we assemble a building council at that time who explore all the details, and we look toward what it, what it could be, and we explore getting ready for a campaign in order to make that happen. Now, here's the challenge as a church, because we want to be unified as a body. If we have the vote now to just build the building, uh, what I would say is, well, we don't have enough details. to. How are we going to do that? How can we vote? But if we wait to vote on the building until we have all the details, now we will have spent all this energy and time getting ready uh, to vote, saying, well, how did we have a mandate even to do that? So we're going to vote twice. We're going to vote on whether to get started and assemble this council and invest what's necessary to have the details to present what it's going to cost, and then we'll vote again later on, probably in the fall, as we get ready for a campaign. But here's most importantly what I'm asking you to do now. Beginning March the 3rd, 
we will have 28 weeks of consecrated prayer and seeking the face of God toward what is to come. We, want, we, we know we can't do anything of significance apart from the Lord's almighty hand. And so I'm going to invite you over and over to join me in 28 weeks of prayer during that time. And uh, we have, as we prayed through this, come up with a name for this campaign and this season, and we've called it Going Beyond at Home. We talk about going beyond all the time, and we tend to think of going overseas, stretching our faith, going to hard places. But the reality is we must continue that for all time. But God's calling us to go beyond right here at home as well because we have neighbors who desperately need to hear the love of Jesus Christ. Folks, none of this stuff happens until we recognize every one of us, our own calling, our mandate to be a sent people. Do you see? The church serve, the, the church uh, m- must never forget that commitment. So what are we supposed to do with this? And if you think about it, we basically, it comes down to a choice. You have a choice. You can, you can be uh, committed to the body of Christ or you can remain uncommitted. You can say, no, I'm not interested in that. And let's be honest, on this side, if you choose to not be committed to the body of Christ, just say, I'm going to be kind of a solo Christian, there are certain advantages to that, right? You have some freedoms that you wouldn't have otherwise. And nobody's going to bother you if you sleep in, you know, for like six weeks in a row. Uh, Nobody's challenging you on the things that may need to change in your life. You have a lot more freedom over here if you think about it. Or you can make the choice to be committed to the local body of Christ. And when this happens, let's be honest, you're setting aside some liberties in order to do this. But there are blessings on this side that you cannot get anywhere else. Deep, meaningful relationships where you know and are known. The Lord sharpens you through the body of Christ in ways you can't imagine. The Lord works through the body and others around you in your community group and in the church to allow you to experience freedom like you've never experienced before. None of that's going to happen until you get committed. You know what else happens in commitment? There are shared victories that we get to celebrate together that cannot happen any other way other than in the local body of believers. That's what God's calling us to. If you are not saved, if you've never trusted Christ as Savior and Lord, that is the very first step that you take in being a part of the collective body of believers, the church of Jesus Christ. Why would you not do that today? You are the church. You are the church for those who trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. Let's remember the privilege we have been given. God has given us such a joy that we get to share life together in this way. Let's be be renewed in our commitment to the church. I'll close with the way God said it because I can't improve on it. You yourselves, as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What a privilege. Let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the power of your word and thank you that I am surrounded by a people who are all in when it comes to this local church. Father, I recognize that there are probably some here And you're going to stretch their faith and call them to be a part of another local body somewhere in the area. God, I pray that they would find a place where they can be fully engaged. God, for those of us here at Kingsland, I pray that you would renew our passion for what's happening here. That we'd be reminded of this holy moment, the magnitude of it, and what you're doing. Father, finally, I pray for the man or woman who has never trusted you as Savior and Lord. I pray that today would be the day of salvation. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Pastor Ryan Rush here, and I just want to thank you for being with us at Kingsland Online today. What an honor. But I'll tell you what would be even better. We'd love to see you get connected with the physical church in the days ahead, if you haven't already. And that means maybe if you're local in the West Houston area, we'd love to see you at Kingsland. Otherwise, regardless, we'd love to help you facilitate uh, jumping into a local church near you, and we can do that together. You can go to kingsland.org slash online connect, kingsland.org slash online connect to find out next steps on your journey. Listen, thanks again for being with us today at Kingsland Online.